Thank you very much. So uh, these are my disclosures. And um, so I've slightly changed the title to include new genes and new genetic mechanisms, um, as you'll see throughout my talk. Just starting with the classic um, <clears throat> mention to the first description of the first causal gene um, in cardiomyopathies, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and in general for inherited uh, heart disease, which is the betamizing heavy chain, <clears throat> sorry, published in 1990. Um, the following years um, have then uh, defined uh, mutations in sarcomere genes as the uh, main cause of a genetically solved, at least, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, we now know that myosin binding protein C is the most prevalent one, followed by beta myosin heavy chain, the troponins, and others, including the myosin light chains. Um, the overall, uh, the uh, prevalence of uh, likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants in these genes in cohorts with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy amounts to maybe currently 30 to 40 percent of uh, proband cohorts. Um, we have here the representation of these, or the, the, the proteins for which these genes code in context in the sarcomere, and this has uh, established uh, apotrophic cardiomyopathy is mainly um, a sarcomeric disease. Um, aside from this 30 to 40 percent, we have a, a, a very significant percentage of patients uh, where we don't know the genetic cause. Um, and also, <clears throat> as I'll show, uh, 5 to 10 percent where uh, there's a cause um, other than sarcomeric. In any way, the, the, all the reviews and a review of evidence, uh, like this one published in 2019 by the ClinGen uh, panel and group, um, still confirm these eight main sarcomeric genes as the main cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or at least with uh, more evidence backing it. Um, some others with moderate evidence have lately been promoted, uh, such as CSRP3, uh, and then others that we're still not showing um, in this uh, latest review by, by ClinGen, were lately described as causal for apotrophic cardiomyopathy, and I will share with you some of uh, this work. Um, as I said before, 5 to 10 percent, more or less, is caused by non-sarcomeric causes, some of them quite rare, such as uh, metabolic conditions such as Fabry disease, of course amyloid, uh, mitochondrial diseases, and, and others. Uh, it's important to recognize these uh, as uh, they uh, need specific management and specific uh, therapies. Um, and the reason why we do genetic testing currently in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is still mostly for the benefit of the family, for a more informed screening and management of family members, um, starting with diagnostic confirmation of the proband including differential diagnosis to those phenocopies that I've mentioned before. Um, uh, Brian next will talk about DCM and probably show that for DCM, uh, the clinical implications are already slightly uh, more different and in a way more directly related to management, but this is still the state of uh, the art for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we, only, uh, we, we, we can only do that, this and help these families and manage them differently based on the recognition of a genetic cause if we do find a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant, which is not the case when uh, we have a variant of non significance or no mutation at all. And it does make a difference to recognize uh, the genetic substrate. Uh, we know from, um, for example, this uh, work of ours that uh, was published recently that when following both an adult and pediatric population uh, for a follow-up for around 10 to 15 years, quite a significant percentage of almost half of them end up developing HCM. And again, I highlight that this included uh, adult patients at baseline. So what's uh, the cause of this, maybe even up to a half, maybe even more than this 30% of patients that are so-called genotype uh, negative? Very broad comparisons have been made for these populations of, of patients, including uh, the one made from uh, data from the shared registry showing um, uh, worse outcomes uh, in a composite endpoint for sarcomere uh, positive patients compared to sarcomere negatives with the VUSs in the middle, 
Uh, we know that uh, morphologically and demographically, these are distinct populations with uh, sarcomere positive patients showing slightly uh, different patterns, for example, of septal hypertrophy with reverse septal uh, um, curvature, with more late CAD, maybe with a little bit less left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Uh, they also tend to be younger patients. Um, and uh, these are very broad comparisons um, that, that have been made, this one from the HCMR. The uh, cause for this genotype negative population is, is probably uh, includes multiple factors, including the variance of a known significance, um, unexplored genomic regions, unknown causal genes, <coughs> misdiagnosis, uh, and acquired disease or a mixture of um, this factor with oligogenic and polygenic uh, models of inheritance. So the VUSs have increasingly been uh, an issue for genetic labs and obviously for, for all of us that, uh, uh, who see these, these patients, um, particularly with the increasing use of high-throughput genetic sequencing technologies. The number of VUSs uh, that are detected has increased and that is the case with any um, inherited condition. Uh, one uh, important and very useful from a clinical practice point of view document uh, was recently uh, published by uh, the Council on uh, Cardiovascular Genetics of the ESC, uh, which um, suggests uh, a group of four or five clinical um, um, parameters that can be used uh, as a way of reclassifying VUSs. And, of, and, and this can be done in clinic um, and um, by the group of genetic counselors working with ICC uh, doctors. And, and the most, one of the most important of those would be um, segregation. Um, and this allows, just to show a very brief example, uh, the upper grade of uh, variants of a non-significance, like this case in one of our families, where this VUS is detected in the proband, and uh, by sequencing, including tissue available from deceased relatives, we proved segregation for this myosin light chain to uh, variant, allowing to add, sorry, to add um, evidence for uh, pathogenicity and upgrading from VUS to likely pathogenic, which is an information that will then uh, prove of benefit for other families where this variant can show up. And there are multiple examples of this, and this is equally important as finding new genes uh, as it does sort uh, part of that missing irritability uh, gap. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that has happened in the latest years also, uh, in part due to the uh, technolo uh, technology advancements, is uh, the ability to look beyond the coding region, beyond the exome, including for deep intronic uh, regions. So it has been suggested for a long time that aside from the exomic regions, uh, a major part of the DNA is also functional. Um, the first work in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to uh, probably show um, the significance of these deep intronic regions was published by uh, Richard Banyal and Chris Simserian's group in Australia with a relatively small cohort where they found this rather, some of them rather deep uh, intronic variants with proven uh, segregation and functional impact uh, showed by RNA studies. We've um, searched for these uh, deep intronic variants in a more kind of um, large uh, cohort and um, um, in, 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 uh, in um, around more than 1,500 hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, uh, with, which were, have been sequenced for the whole genomic region of the sarcomeric genes, um, and also part of them with whole exome sequencing, which still allows to uh, look into more or less 100 base pairs each side of, the, of an exome. Um, and we found this probably unexpected high prevalence of 2% of uh, deep intronic, um, likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants just on myosin binding protein C, um, which anyway might be the most important gene from, for which to find this type of variants uh, due to the known impact of um, truncating and upload insufficiency uh, in myosin binding protein C. Um, a paper from the Oxford group published in the exact same um, edition of uh, CERC Genetics um, also uh, corroborated the 1% prevalence uh, 
and showed a, a linkage between this particular minus 52 variant and this uh, um, large deletion, intronic deletion, particularly prevalent um, in South Asian individuals, which was known for years, but uh, for, for in terms of its pathogenic consequence was clearly uh, not established. Uh, and it seems to be the case that um, the pathogenicity only comes because of the uh, linkage with this minus 52 variant, which is quite an interesting observation. Going, going into new causal genes uh, and sharing our recent um, research experience, um, leveraging whole exome sequencing in almost one, uh, 800 patients, we did burden testing across uh, uh, the exome, comparing cases against controls, uh, and one gene uh, was uh, particularly uh, highlighted from this uh, burden testing, ALPK3, um, versus UCL internal controls. ALPK3 had been described as a very rare cause of pediatric cardiomyopathy when inherited with an autosomal recessive pattern, um, but it was never um, suggested as an, as, as an autosomal dominant cause of HCM. So in our discovery cohort and in a validation cohort of more than 2,000 patients, we found a prevalence of around 1.6%. This was uh, very significantly higher than the burden of the same rare truncating variants in this gene uh, in GNOMAD. Looking into the phenotypes of these patients, we started to see a pattern that looked um, interesting with more me to apical hypertrophy, lots of GADs, uh, ECGs with some of them with short PRs and definitely very large voltages. And almost all of these patients had the mention on their clinical notes, looking retrospectively as to uh, a possible suspicion of a phenocopy that was never confirmed. So there was this kind of metabolic phenocopy feeling into these patients. Uh, we did segregation on uh, both validation and discovery cohorts. Um, this table, or this figure rather, uh, summarizes some of the findings that um, I've just mentioned. Uh, and there was importantly uh, also significant prevalence of evolution to heart failure or need for heart transplant. The histology, aside from a lot of fibrosis, also showed um, um, PAS negative uh, vacuolation of the cardiomyocytes, uh, which is still something that we don't know why it, um, it's happening in these patients. And this is, that was from uh, myectomy uh, samples. Um, and they have at least an outcome in terms of heart failure related endpoints as malignant as sarcomere positives, uh, maybe even with a tendency to be uh, worse. Uh, so this was published recently. And then uh, some functional work that uh, we are doing in collaboration with uh, a group from Australia led by um, David Elliott um, is, um, and this is as a, as a preprint, a preprint um, has uh, shown that uh, ALPK3 uh, does interact with um, some sarcomere proteins, mainly in the M band, um, and, and is probably quite uh, important for the, uh, maintaining the integrity of the sarcomere uh, by interacting with these proteins. Other uh, new genes uh, in, in multicenter work that we have contributed include FHOD3, which is an actin interacting and organizing protein. Again, 1 to 2% of HCM cases explained by it. Copy number variants in this uh, gene um, have also proven to be uh, pathogenic in the follow-on uh, work. TRIM63, again, um, work from London together with uh, some uh, collaborators from Spain, mainly, um, showing here an autosomal recessive cause uh, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, which is not the most common genetic mechanism. Uh, in this uh, gene that codes for a protein important for ubiquitin uh, pathways and interacts also with sarcomere proteins. So little by little, uh, this contribution of new genes, deep intronic variants, CNVs, probably undiagnosed phenocopies, can solve a little bit of this missing irritability by around 6 to 7%. Um, but may, none of these uh, uh, causes uh, is probably the major contributor to, this gen to the genotype negative patients. And I think the, one of the best and most impactful insights comes from a, a 
recent work with common variants. So the end of the spectrum, or the other end of the spectrum, in terms of uh, effect size compared to the rare variants that are detected with uh, uh, high throughput genetic sequencing technologies. Um, two papers have been published recently describing uh, loci with an enrichment of uh, common variants in HCM cases compared to controls. Uh, this is one of them um, led by uh, Professor Hugh Watkins. Some of these uh, loci, as you will see, are in common with Mendelian causes of hypertrophic adamelopathy, and for example, ALPK3 is here, uh, but most of them aren't and involve uh, probably other still uh, mechanisms to be um, solved. Um, if we do a, a polygenic risk score combining this loci uh, and compare uh, quintiles, uh, upper versus lower, we can see a, a huge, a significant difference between uh, the upper and lower 20% in terms of uh, odds ratio for developing HCM. And this effect is particularly uh, higher for sarcomere negative patients. Um, the same work leveraged the uh, GWAS sequencing to do a Mendelian randomization um, discovery with um, highlighting particularly a huge effect of diastolic blood pressure for sarcomere negatives in developing HCM, which is another important concept. Uh, this uh, other GWAS work was published in the same uh, Nature Genetics edition with similar findings and some low say that are overlapping. Uh, this, um, for example, taking ALPK3 uh, in this nice um, uh, editorial by Roddy Walsh, um, there is a, a suggestion that at least for some of these genes, they might have a contribution throughout, throughout the whole spectrum of that graph that I showed of size versus minor allele frequency. So important uh, with common variation and also important as uh, rare variants causing Mendelian disease. Uh, this other paper by uh, Roddy Walsh that summarizes the, the, evi the evidence um, for some of these new genes that I've mentioned, again, including ALPK3, FHOD3, and TRIM63. Um, and to finish, the, the, the key to understanding these genotype negative patients and how they, be, they behave um, does also have to come uh, from the contribution of environmental factors. Um, and recent work has shown an interaction, for example, of obesity with neocarticiation class, um, also incidence for some of heart failure uh, endpoints, probably interfering uh, with some pathways uh, within the cardiomyocyte uh, that are important for the pathophysiology of HCM. Um, we have also published the influence of hypertension, diabetes, and obese in the European Registry of Cardiomyopathies, again showing uh, that some of these factors are phenotype uh, modifiers. And my last slide with this uh, nice uh, figure from um, um, an article um, uh, viewpoint from, from Professor Watkins uh, with the current status of understanding of the, this breakdown between the genotype negative and uh, positive, uh, highlighting the interaction of this polygenic inheritance and comorbidities on sarcomere negative patients, which does have um, important implications for the follow-up of the families and also for the management of the patients uh, themselves. Thank you very much. This is all the, our groups and collaborators that are working with us on, on this. Thank you very much to all. Uh, so next up, we've got Brian Haldy. Uh, I stumbled across Brian when he was doing his uh, PhD, where he casually trotted out a Lancet paper and many other um, major outputs, so incredibly impressive. Uh, Brian is a consultant cardiologist at the Brompton, and he's also secured intermediate fellowship from the BHF, which is no small undertaking, and he's running a big trial. So it's uh, safe to say that Brian's influenced guidelines already in his career, which is fantastic. So Brian, I hope you're going to shed lots of light on delayed cardiomyopathy while making a precise diagnosis matters. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, and, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me today to talk a little bit about dilated cardiomyopathy. And, and hopefully over the next 15 minutes, I'll persuade you why making a precise diagnosis um, in these patients is important. So, so dilated cardiomyopathy, of course, is not a diagnosis, but it, it is really a common phenotype 
Um, and within this common phenotype, there's a family of, of overlapping diseases, um, all with elements of intrinsic genetic susceptibility frequently unmasked by different acquired insults. So, so the ground truth probably is, is, is really something like this. We, we've got rare genetic variants found in about 20 to 30 percent of patients. And, and some of these follow a typical Mendelian pattern of inheritance and others do not. And then we've also got contributions from these common genetic variants to so the cumulative effect of multiple different common variants um, um, occurring in, in an individual to increase their susceptibility. And then these extrinsic or acquired insults, be them toxic, inflammatory or hemodynamic. And these come together to produce a common phenotype. And within this phenotype, there's shared and common disease mechanisms. So whenever we look at a patient on MRI, then this is what their heart looks like. But we need to delve a little bit deeper. So how precise are we currently at making a, a diagnosis of the cause of someone's dilated cardiomyopathy? So uh, we, we tasked a medical student to, to try to find a little bit more about this a couple of years ago. And he took 60 consecutive cases that were referred to our um, service um, and he, he gathered their information in three different parts and presented it to six different clinicians and asked them to make a diagnosis of the cause. To begin with, he gave them just the, the simple clinical data, the history, the family pedigree, the ECG, the blood tests, um, and the exposures in the environment that might be relevant. After that, he gave them the genetic data, so all of these patients had a standard DCM panel um, as part of research, so there was no selection bias here. And, and asked them to, to reattribute the cause after this, and then finally we gave them the MRI data. And this is the agreement between the six different clinicians. So to start off, the Kappa co um, coefficient um, of, of, of agreement was 0.45. So the clinicians had fairly poor agreement when we just gave them basic clinical information. And after we gave them genetic and CMR data, the, the, the agreement between them improved. And perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the confidence in the clinicians at making the diagnosis w w was also better. So we go from a fairly imprecise approach, when we add more comprehensive phenotypic and genotypic data, we get more precise and hopefully more accurate as well. So why is it important to be precise and accurate? So, so this is a, a, a case from clinic a few years ago. So a 39-year-old chap who presented with mildly reduced exercise tolerance. Um, some palpitation and he had some non-sustained VT <coughs> corresponding to his palpitation whenever we um, did his Holter monitor. His MRI showed that he'd got mildly impaired ventricular function, but, but perhaps more concerningly, he had this ring-like pattern of late enhancement on his MRI scan that raises our blood pressure a little bit. His family history was a bit incomplete. The details weren't um, um, all available, but, but his father had died suddenly aged 65, and, and this had been attributed to a myocardial infarction because he had a history of peripheral vascular disease and type 2 diabetes. He didn't have a post-mortem, and he, there were certainly no enter to, um, thoughts about um, a molecular autopsy at this stage. His paternal uncle lived in another country. The, the details were fairly sparse, but he'd been diagnosed with heart failure in his 40s and, and died um, shortly after that. So he did his genetics back in 2017. He had a comprehensive panel at this stage, and we didn't find any likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants. So we decided we would not put in an ICD um, at our MDT because on, on balance, we didn't think there was quite so much. A few years later, and after, we, after there'd been a few more genes added to the panel, we repeated it, and of course, we found a pathogenic nonsense variant in, in filament C. And this changed our approach to risk stratification based on some of the papers that were published in the interim. So filament C truncations are associated with a higher risk of sudden death. This is uh, a paper from a few years ago from Louisa Mastroni's group showing that actually the risk of sudden death is fairly constant across all ejection fractions. And whenever you think about heart failure events, competing risks, these of course increase rapidly with lower ejection fractions. So actually the proportional risk of sudden death is perhaps highest for these patients with mildly reduced ejection fraction. So here, um, a case where we're a precise diagnosis makes a difference to the patient, not only to the patient, but also how we manage um, um, his family. And, and this kind of precision approach to risk stratification has now made it into our guidelines. So these are the recent ASC guidelines for ventricular arrhythmia, and, and similar um, approaches make it into the heart failure guidelines.
And these are based mostly on single or multi-centre studies where, where we look at outcomes driven by genotype across cohorts of DCM. And I think it's important whenever we interpret these studies that we remember that these are tertiary referral centre populations, likely patients with the most severe disease, and there is likely to be an element of selection bias in them. So, so the risk um, across the population may not be quite so significant as this. But nevertheless, we end up with, with this type of spectrum where we think about risk associated with different genotypes. This is dynamic in a moving field, but this is my current kind of thinking around this area. Lamin's been around for a long time. We've got lots of information about it, and we now have our own risk calculator to predict the risk of ventricular arrhythmias in patients with this single genotype. This calculator was derived from over 800 patients. And actually, when we look in external validation cohorts, the, the precision of this model at predicting ventricular arrhythmia is actually really good. So when we compare this to other risk calculators that we use for more heterogeneous populations like HCM, the, 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 the um, performance of this model is superior, likely because of the slightly more homogen homogeneous nature of, of, of the population that we're looking at. So we can guide device implantation, but what about medical therapy? We're probably slightly less advanced in, 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 in this field, but there, there are situations where, where making a precise diagnosis can help us with therapy. So another case, a 41-year-old chap pre presented with new onset heart failure, history of sudden death in his father, age 27, and his daughter came forward for screening after his diagnosis, and indeed had a mild phenotype of DCM at that stage. His ECG showed multifocal ventricular ectopics, and indeed his Holter monitor showed that there's a 45% burden, as well as non-stained VT and some superventricular ectopics. His MRI showed linear midwall, late enhancement, and a pretty awful biventricular function. So we, we treated him very aggressively with, with maximum dose guideline directed medical therapy. He had, a, he had a dual chamber ICD early because of the clinical picture. But after Hopefully we would have lost my place. <laughs> Super, thank you. <laughs> um, but, but after three to six months, he was no better. So he, he did no reverse remodeling. He was still very symptomatic. And we were left with a difficult decision. Do we put this young man on, on amiodarone? a therapy without much longevity probably in, in, at, at this age group. Should we think about an ablation of multifugal ventricular ectopics that might be very challenging, or should we refer him for a transplant? And his genetics came back and had a pathogenic SCM5A variant. And indeed, there's case series and systematic reviews looking at patients of these types of variants, um, and, and, and importantly showing response to sodium channel blockers, targeting the molecular consequences of these specific variants. So he started on a sodium channel blocker, and six months later, he had MOHA class one symptoms, and his ejection fraction improved to 45%. So we can make differences with medical therapy in a small number of cases. So where should this fall in line along with guideline-directed medical therapy? So of course, all our patients with heart failure should get quadruple therapy in line with guidelines, and we should think about devices um, to improve their heart failure if, if the indications for CRT and ICDs in those that we think are high risk of sudden death. But these therapies really deal with the consequences of contractile impairment. They deal with neurohormonal activation that occurs further on down the, the disease cascade and, and, and dampen that down. So they try to put the fire out when the fire's already started. And perhaps what we should be trying to focus on are therapies that target the primary molecular cause of the problem and, and may be able to put the fire out or, or stop the fire from starting rather than putting it out. And perhaps these therapies can even prevent disease expression if we use them very early on in the disease course. So I think these therapies will come in and, and they will work alongside our guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure. So which mechanisms should we target? And I think these are a really super paper um, recently published at Science, a collaboration between colleagues at Imperial, Cambridge and Harvard, looked at 61 explanted hearts, so patients with very advanced heart failure, referred for transplant, 
and it used single cell transcriptomics to identify gene expression and differential gene expression across the genotypes. And this paper showed that there, there are shared mechanisms, but also distinct mechanisms across different genotypes. So perhaps we should be targeting different pathways in different genotypes. Now this uses advanced um, uh, patients with advanced disease. So it's really end of the line type patients. And perhaps our focus now should be trying to um, profile the early disease mechanisms that drive people with very early disease because that's, that's the stage at which we really want to be targeting things in the next five to 10 years. So of course, only 20 to 30% of patients will have a rare variant. So what about those patients who have gene negative disease? Well, this is two wonderful papers over the last few years. So one from our colleagues in Maastricht and one led by my colleague Paz Tile, um, looking at a phenogrouping uh, approach for patients with ambulatory DCM. So most of these are MHA class one and two. And it looks to group patients based on their clinical imaging and genetic characteristics. Um, and, and they found that there are really three or four different phenogroups of, of dilated cardiomyopathy and using either proteomics or RNA sequencing, they found that there are different disease mechanisms driving disease in different phenogroups. And perhaps these type of approaches will allow us to target the, the mechanisms that are driving disease across these groups. So a little bit about precision prediction of disease penetrance. So we know from a recent paper from Ray Hirschberger's group that the lifetime risk in first degree relatives of developing DCM is about 20 to 30%. But we know from our clinical practice that these two families will have very different um, um, risks of developing disease. So on the left, we've got a case of an isolated case of dilated cardiomyopathy, a patient in their 60s, all first degree relatives, phenotype negative, with probably a relatively low risk of developing a, um, a phenotype over their lifetime. On the right, we've got a, 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 another family with, with an incompletely penetrant um, truncating variant in Titan. So I think what we should be aiming for is, is trying to predict the, the, the risk of penetrance in these first degree relatives and using this as, as, as a way of trying to um, um, move towards a shared decision making approach on, on how we screen these individuals. I think more and more with, with more whole genome sequencing used for, for different things, we will have more incidental findings of DCM variants as secondary findings. So a patient going for um, sc uh, unit screening because of breast cancer or something like that, and, and, and we now have reportable findings, so truncating variants in Titan or truncating variants in filament C, these are now reported um, um, as a coincidental finding. And really the penetrance of these types of variants in, 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 in otherwise healthy populations with, without family histories and without phenotypes is, is, is a lot less um, than the penetrance in the families that we see. So I think we need, we need a different approach to how we manage these patients and also whether their family members need investigation. I think common variation polygenic risk will help us, okay, so um, similar to, to, to Louis' talk, last. Similarly, in DCM, um, polygenic risk does associate it with the risk of developing disease across large population and is also associated with the expression of rare variants within families. So perhaps we can bring together environmental exposures, family history, common variation and rare variation to produce um, a, an estimate of lifetime risk. So precision therapy is great, but why aren't we there yet? Why is it difficult? Well, to prove that a therapy works, we need trials, and, and trials need patient and events to prove that that therapy works. And patients with specific genotypes are rare. So we recently participated in this Realm DCM trial, as I'm sure many others did, looking at um, patients with Lamin DCM. This was a trial that I think recruited about 160 patients, but it needed nearly as many, many centers as patients across the world and took many years to, to recruit. So it was difficult to recruit these patients into studies. Guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure is very effective, so the incremental benefit of additional therapies is going to be relatively few. As I said, guideline directed medical therapy really works, you know, it, it best in more advanced disease. Precision therapies maybe have an earlier role targeting very early disease, 
but proving the therapy works in, in, in early disease when outcomes are, are generally good or will take time to, to accrue is also very difficult. Um, it, you know, it, it is also difficult. So we re really need large national, international registries of these types of patients that we can put into trials, um, and we need robust surrogate endpoints that the regulators are going to accept. So precision diagnosis and management of DCM is a multidisciplinary pursuit. We need to work with all of our colleagues. It helps guide sudden death risk stratification at the moment, and it will increasingly do so in the coming years. And it will begin to more and more guide medical therapy. Our goal should be to prevent the development of heart failure through the targeting of early disease susceptible individuals rather than really targeting heart failure once it's developed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for such a clear and insightful talk. It's really exciting to see the evolution of our, of our treatments. Um, so the next speaker is Dr. Christopher Vissing, um, who we're delighted to um, have joining us. And he's a postdoc research fellow at the Department of Cardiology at the University Hospital in Copenhagen. His main research interest is focusing on the diagnostic workup and clinical management of patients with inherited cardiomyopathies. And I'm really excited that you're going to talk about the yield from family screening when there's a case of DCM identified, because certainly my experience is that we're picking up more and more of these cases. They're coming to us for family screening, and we need to be sure to use our precious resources appropriately to, to screen the right patients. Mm -hmm. So when the technical side of things is, is there... Um, Confirmation email as well. Okay. Confirmation from who? From the one I sent the slides to. Okay. Okay, we'll go. We'll do the abstract next then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so next up is Joe Westerby. So, uh, I think everybody knows who Joe Westerby is. Uh, he's a histopathologist. Um, he uh, has done lots of work in, with, with cardiac risk in the young, and he's got a major interest in sudden cardiac death. Uh, he's worked with uh, Mary Shepherd over the years and written lots of papers, lots of books, and essential to the UK's histopathology. So, Joe, I'm absolutely delighted you're talking about obesity, cardiomyopathy. This is a massively shifting area. We're going to have a billion people around the world with obesity. Obesity is a major driver of heart failure and there's major therapies coming down the line. So I'm absolutely fascinated to see what you're going to say about your about your, your abstract. So fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to present on this study. I believe I've been given three minutes, so that's a bit of a challenge to get through. Uh, but I will... You can present. have four, don't worry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that bonus minute there. Um, so uh, this is a relatively maybe controversial study, but um, as, as you've just said, obesity is becoming a, a worldwide epidemic. It's now thought to affect 13% of the world's population. It's more in um, first world countries, but this is also coming into third world countries as well. And obesity cardiomyopathy is a cardiomegaly or a heart failure that's related to obesity without the other causes that may be coexistent with obesity such as hypertension, diabetes and chronic uh, ischemic heart disease, so occlusion of the coronary arteries. Currently, we've not got any well-defined pathological criteria for this condition. So what our study did is it looked at our entire population, so we've got 6,457 cases of sudden cardiac death, and we looked at the different BMIs that were present in them. And we found that there were 1,202 cases with uh, an, a, a BMI consistent with obesity. And then we age and sex matched them to individuals who were of a healthy weight. So we looked, we found 53 cases of unexplained cardiomegaly within the obese population. And we then age and sex matched them to healthy weight individuals and also individuals with obesity who did not have an increased heart weight. What we found when we did this analysis is that there was an odds ratio of 5.3. So 4% of the individuals with obesity had unexplained cardiomegaly compared to 1% in the healthy weight population. We got these 50, 53 individuals and they had, um, they had an average age of 42 plus minus 12 and death predominantly occurred at rest without any preceding symptoms. 
Males tended to die at a younger age, so 40 compared to 45. And BMI in the individuals who had this cardiomegaly was considerably greater in those compared to the obese population, which did not have the cardiomegaly. Our average heart weight was nearly 600 grams. So that's much higher than what you would expect, which is 550 in males and 450 in females would be what we would consider abnormal. So these were our findings. You can see on the left-hand side at the top there is what we found in obesity cardiomyopathy. So you can see that there's more fat in both the obesity cardiomyopathy and the obese population. You can see it's more yellow on the front of the heart compared to the normal heart, which has less fat. And that's particularly on the front of the heart. We didn't find that in the posterior aspect of the heart. And then you can also see that the muscle size was increased in the obesity one, uh, the obesity cardiomyopathy population, compared to the obese controls and also the healthy weight population. So you can see that both the left ventricle, uh, do I have a pointer, which is um, up there, uh, and also the right ventricle wall were increased throughout both all the measurements that we made. So to conclude, obesity cardiomyopathy is a specific entity. It's seen in males at a younger age and in, in those with an, uh, uh, a higher BMI, so it's 35 to 40. We would propose a diagnostic criteria in individuals that die suddenly of greater than 550 grams in males and 450 grams in females. And this is in the absence of other causes of cardiac enlargement, such as hypertension, diabetes, or coronary artery disease. And we think it's very important that these patients are investigated further with molecular autopsy to see if there are any possible genetic factors that play into this, and also to follow up the family members as well to screen them to see if there are any cardiac conditions. Thank you very much. And just my Thank you very much. As well. Great. So back to Dr. Christopher Vissing. Yeah, dramatic entry and exit and entry again. So I apologize for that. I apparently sent my slides to the wrong email, but now they're here. So thank you for coming to talk to us about dilated cardiomyopathy. And thank you very much for inviting me and having me. Slides should be on now. So this would have been a perfect talk just after Brian's talk, but now it's just a bit delayed. And um, I'll talk a bit about family screening and the yield of it. So in uh, precision medicine, we try to find out who to treat. And this is a, a who to treat study, but perhaps also uh, when to treat patients and how to treat them. And, oh, no. Do you want to wait a moment? I'll just see Yeah, I think they're on it. We've got time. So. Great. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, this is the title of uh, of uh, my talk: Family Screening and Dilated Cardiomyopathy. And when we talk about the yield, we'll both talk about the prevalence, that is, the the yield at baseline, the incidence uh, during follow-up. Then I'll talk about the potential for perhaps limiting follow-up some in these patients. These are my disclosures. Sadly, I have none. So it's going to be really exciting today because this is my favorite group of disorders, the inherited cardiac disorders and the inherited cardiomyopathies in particular. And in, uh, in Denmark, we've done family screening for these disorders since 2006. Uh, we started out at, at my hospital in Copenhagen, Rigshospital, but now we do it at uh, 15, 15 different hospitals in Denmark. And we've screened loads and loads of patient, patients. We're not just talking about inherited cardiomyopathies today. We're talking about my absolute favorite cardiomyopathy, that is the dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype. So this is, as you know, characterized by dilation of the left ventricle, thinning of the ventricular wall, and it ends with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, heart failure, arrhythmias, premature death, a very serious disease. But we can treat it. As I mentioned, it's, a, it's an inherited, this is an inherited uh, cardiomyopathy, but that's not to say it's a congenital uh, cardiomyopathy. So most uh, patients are born with a normal heart, as you and I, but they have some genetic, environmental, or toxic affection. 
of the heart muscle that leads to some progression of disease, as Brian's already mentioned. In the beginning, it will be dilation of the left ventricle. And at this point in time, most patients are asymptomatic. That is, they are in a presymptomatic stage of disease. However, giving this constant affection of the heart muscle and the progressive nature of this disease will eventually go on to develop left ventricular systolic dysfunction and have, uh, you know, fulfill criteria for the dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype. And as I mentioned, this is associated with heart failure, arrhythmias, and premature death. So this is something we would want to avoid. In the 1950s and up until the 1990s, I think we thought of this disease as a kind of sporadic disorder that occurred at random. But in the past 30 years or so, we found that 50% of cases, uh, there is a familial aggregation of disease. So in 50% of indexed cases, we can find that a family member also has the disease. So this is kind of then the new hypothesis of the disease, that we have this progressive nature of disease. So people start out with a normal heart, and then they go through all these stages of, of uh, the disease. And this really forms the basis of family screening, because what that allows us to do is to go from treating symptoms, so treating patients at a stage where they have very severe disease, to perhaps prevent progression, and even in the future, prevent onset. So the theory is to make an early diagnosis, to make early intervention, and in that way, perhaps improve uh, the high morbidity and mortality burden of this disease. So this leads us to the study that I'm going to be presenting to you now. So this is a study about family screening and dilated cardiomyopathy, and the questions we posed ourselves were, what is the yield of family screening? Because I think it's become quite accepted in most Western countries, at least, that we perform family screening in these, uh, in these diseases, but there's not a lot of data on the yield of it. But then also, if we can identify patients who are at high or low risk of developing disease during follow-up, because how, how focused do we have to screen these patients? How intensely do we have to screen them? So this is really a question of who to treat. So why is this important? Well, this is data from, uh, from our side. And what it shows you on the x-axis is the calendar years. And what it shows you on the i-axis is the first time a family member is screened at our clinic uh, for dilated cardiomyopathy. And as I think you'll be able to appreciate from this graph, the number of patients we see for the first time increases and increases throughout you know, the calendar years. And that means with rescreening, the burden of screening is really big. And in a healthcare setting where we don't have unlimited resources, I think it's important to focus on patients who actually need to be screened. So the question is, how often should we screen relatives? And I think the answer right now is <laughs> we don't really have any evidence to support it. And right now, we don't really have any clue. So every time I meet someone from another country than Denmark, I always ask the person, so how often do you screen your DCM relatives? And the answer is always something like, mm. <laughs> Sometimes once a year, sometimes I don't screen them anymore, and uh, sometimes it's every three to five years. But really, it's, it's just a gut feeling. So of course, we want to we wanna provide some data to support the way that we screen these patients. So we did that uh, in, in this study, where we included uh, 211 families. Um, in these families, we had 563 relatives who were screened at our family screening unit. They were screened in the period from 2006 to 2020. And uh, our workup, these uh, family members are a genetic screening, if, uh, if, if we found anything in the propand, then it's an ECG and an echo, and then there's more add-on uh, add stuff. And again, the goal was to identify the individual disease risk of these patients. So we tried to do that by stratifying these patients into four groups, depending on genetic findings, that is, in families with a likely pathogenic, pathogenic uh, variant, do the family member carry that variant or not? And on ECG and echo findings, that is, is there any uh, non-diagnostic abnormalities on a baseline ECG or echo? 
So first I'll show you the results from the genetic screening. So we had 211 families, 186 of these families were screened. We found the genetic yield of screening to be 37%. That is pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants were found in 37% of families. A rather large proportion of patients had variants of uncertain significance uh, and also a large proportion didn't have any findings. So what about the specific uh, genetic makeup of these variants? Well, by far the most common is truncations in Titan. And then in, in Denmark, we also have a, a quite high proportion of RBM20 patients. But otherwise, in general, it's, it's a whole host of different genes that are involved. And, um, and they are uh, by themselves quite rare compared to the truncating Titan variants. So that's all well. Now look at, let's look at the baseline findings. How many of the patients we screen have a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype at baseline? And how many of them can we group into these four different groups, depending on the genetic findings and the objective findings at baseline? And I'll show you that here. So this is a donut plot. On the top left-hand side, we have in orange here patients whom we knew had a DCM phenotype before we screened them. Then we have here in pink patients who were identified to have a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype at baseline. So that is both hypokinetic non-dilated cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. And then we had this you know, whole group of patients who did not fulfill criteria for a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype, but who we did you know, perform genetic screening in, a subset of, uh, and, and who were all, you know, uh, screened by ECG and ECHO. And what we found was that 50% of these patients um, had told normal findings at baseline. Okay, so now we know that a baseline screening, the yield of baseline screening is actually quite high, I think. 17% were found to have a, a new uh, dilated cardiomyopathy band type, so that's nice. Let's look a bit more into this group. What's char what characterized this group? Well. Here I show you the prevalence depending on the age at the, first, uh, at the first screening visit, as you can appreciate in these four groups, age groups that I've created. The prevalence of dilated cardiomyopathy increases with increasing age. That sort of fits with our idea of the disease as a progressive uh, disorder, but still it's, it's, it's still around 10% in those aged uh, uh, less than 30. So. Quite, still quite high. All right, but what about follow-up? Well, I think we know what to do with the patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. They often go into uh, heart failure clinics, or if there's a good reason, we can also screen them more at our clinic. But in general, they don't really require more diagnostic screening. So we still have this huge group of, of, of patients. So, oi, oi. Okay, the slide is somewhat messed up. Um, so in the top graph here, I tried to, to, to divide them, them out into different flows. In the top here are patients who are genotype negative, that is non-carriers of likely pathogenic or pathogenic family variants. In the middle, we have patients with normal findings. Here we have patients who have a normal echo or ECG at baseline. And here are patients who carry a family uh, variant, a, a likely pathogenic or pathogenic family variant. What I think you'll be able to appreciate is that we, not, we don't need to scream non-carriers anymore. I don't think a lot of people do that anyways, uh, but it's, it's definitely not required because none of them develop dilated cardiomyopathy during a median of five years of follow-up. But also, and perhaps very importantly, the large, large group of patients, the large group of 268 patients the risk of developing dilated cardiomyopathy during follow-up is very low. Only five develop it. So this, this rate of developing dilated cardiomyopathy would be close to the rate of developing heart failure in the middle-aged population. So quite low. On the other hand, any objective finding, be that an abnormal uh, uh, echo or ECG or an abnormal <coughs> genetic finding, it does indicate a high risk of developing uh, dilated cardiomyopathy during follow-up. 
So if removing <clears throat> now uh, the patients where we have uh, genetic information, because I think we know mostly what to do with these patients, and purely looking at, at, um, at the, those stratified by the objective findings on an echo and ECG, we have now looked into the cumulative incidence, so this is the years of follow-up on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis is the cumulative incidence of dilated cardiomyopathy, and as you'll be able to appreciate, the rate is way higher in patients who have abnormal uh, findings with a hazard ratio of 13, that's huge, but also the risk of developing uh, dilated cardiomyopathy during at least the first five years of follow-up is very low in the other group. So should we screen these patients? I'm not sure. Another way to look at it, this is the age-specific incidence rates um, per thousand person years in patients with abnormal versus normal uh, baseline findings. The rate is, is higher in all uh, age groups in patients with abnormal findings at baseline and uh, low throughout the disease history. Um, so, in conclusion, I would say that screening is effective. It has high yield. We identify one in three uh, of, of our patients to either have a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype or have a genetic predisposition to dilated cardiomyopathy. But we also find that 58% of, of the persons we screen at baseline have a very low risk of developing dilated cardiomyopathy during follow-up. And I think uh, we can probably safely reduce uh, the intensity or frequency of screening in these low-risk relatives. So uh, on the question of uh, who to treat, who to screen, I would say all first-degree relatives should be screened at least once, as we do now. Relatives with abnormal findings should be screened every one to three years. But in relatives who have normal findings at baseline, perhaps we should uh, consider the need for further screening and at least a lower frequency of screening in these relatives. <coughs> so I just want to say thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to, to show these, uh, these findings. And um, I just defended my PhD thesis on precision medicine and inherited cardiomyopathies. So if any one of you want a copy of that, please write my email. <laughs> And um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much to all our speakers. I'd like to invite them onto the stage now to have our panel discussion. Um, Great. So I've certainly got questions, but I'd like to open it out to the audience to see if they've got questions to begin with. I don't know if you want to put your hands up and then Mark will come and uh, find you with the roving mic or Dimitra. I'm like the guy from the Bake Off, you know, so I'm going to run around the room. <laughs> Nobody watches Bake Off. There you go. Okay, one at the back. Okay, great. I'm supposed to make some personal comment about you, but I won't. So just ask your question. Thanks very much. Uh, great talks. As cardiologists, we tend to think that uh, MRI is the be-all and end-all of screening uh, and superior to echo. But I'm just wondering, particularly in dilated cardiomyopathy families, whether we could go even further back in diagnosis and look at circulating biomarkers of collagen breakdown and repair mechanisms, active inflammation, uh, to really get at the root of it and be able to be more definitive in our reassurance, particularly if the normal cardiac tests if the, no, if the usual cardiac test turn out normal. So who do you want to ask that to? Just, uh... All of you. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give it a good start. Um, it, it, so uh, I, I, I think... <laughs> I think with, with collagen biomarkers, the difficulty is that, it, you know, it, it's a systemic circulating biomarker. It's not cardiac specific. So if, if, if a 
patient or a person has elevated collagen biomarkers and they have diabetes and a bit of renal impairment, that might not necessarily be particularly sensitive. I, I think it may be sensitive in young people, particularly with fibrotic forms of DCM, filament C, lamin, desmoplakin, but then we'll be able to diagnose them because they carry the gene. Um, I, I, I think MRI is very helpful for um, to screen relatives um, of a proband with a fibrotic form of DCM. Uh, I, I think because we often pick up early disease expression because fibrosis is, is the earliest finding. And I think we've had cases of filament C where an ECG is normal, LV function is normal, their echo looks normal, but then they've got horrendous fibrosis on their MRI. So I, I think MRI is helpful um, in specific situations particularly. So any more questions from the audience? Uh, thank you. Great talks. Um, question for the last speaker, I um, presume. So what do you think of the um, utility would be of um, artificial intelligence and deep learning um, in terms of just deciding who we, we could potentially follow up? Is that something you've thought about or something that you think will be useful in the next, I don't know, five, ten years, for example? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good question. So, <clears throat> the, the the data I presented that was a very you know simple data and and the amount of, of data uh, in that sort of risk stratification um, was uh, would not require I think an artificial intelligence. But I, I think as as the amount of data we get on our patients increases and increases, uh, that that would definitely be a good approach. Um, and also just but finding a way to harmonize all that data and really you know <coughs> putting it to good use I think that's something that will will definitely do more of in the future so I think that's that is going to be um, the next step if I do I'm gonna ask you a quick question just on, on the way Joe so when we hear about obesity <coughs> cardiomyopathy we hear about many potential causes of obesity cardiomyopathy. We're supposed to think that epicardial um, adipose tissue causes inflammation, uh, all, the, all these uh, hypertrophied adipocytes causing you know, inflammation and invading the myocardium. And we're supposed to hear about abnormal blood vessels, large and small, microvascular disease, abnormal kidneys. So you looked at the heart and the fat in the heart. Did you look at the rest of the the rest of the heart and the body, and is inflammation a real factor in obesity cardiomyopathy? Um, excellent question. Uh, we are a national referral centre for sudden cardiac death, so we actually only get the heart, unfortunately. So with regards to comments on the rest of the body, I'm not really able to pass many comments on there. Certainly we see more epicardial fat. I wouldn't say we definitely saw any sort of vascular abnormalities. It doesn't from what I can see, it doesn't look to have sort of an inflammatory myocarditis or maybe an arrhythmogenic, hot phase arrhythmogenic inflammatory-like pattern. And we're not seeing loads of aggregation of lymphocytes and things within the epicardial fat, but I know that they are meant to support the um, inflammation within the epicardial fat itself. So I think that's a major finding because there's a huge narrative at the moment in heart failure cardiology about obesity cardiomyopathy being an inflammatory state. So I would publish that fairly quickly because so there's billions of pounds going into that. Here, here's some. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, just say genetic geneticist's question. So Francis, genetics, Wales. Uh, in rare disease in genetics, we're very good at sharing uh, sort of patients uh, and data across the NHS uh, we use for Decipher database. And this is a question thinking about the large cohorts and large uh, sort of genotyped cohorts. Uh, how can we make this work better? Uh, in one sense, there are patients who get sucked into tertiary referral centres or quaternary referral centres, and in one sense, that's fine. But there are probably lots of patients around the region who have been genotyped uh, some between uh, cardiology and genetics in the regions. Uh, and how can we make sure we bring them in, into cohorts? Um, we use the Decipher database. Uh, I know that uh, of the specialist NHS labs in England doing cardiology, 
Bristol had managed to get at least some of its patients onto Decipher, is that uh, a, a resource which anyone from the cardiology side has mined to get to patients? Uh, and how can we make this work better? And it, maybe there are people in the audience who can also answer that if yeah. they've got more anyone experience. From the, anyone from the <laughs> genetics labs? Uh, sorry, I can only see the panel yeah, yeah, <laughs> sitting of behind. Yeah. Has anyone got any comments on that? I mean, I think the sharing of this data is ultimately the way forward to improve the care of our patients, but it's, I think the difficulty we've had is inputting all the right data parameters. It's just a huge undertaking for all that um, appropriate phenotyping. Um, but it has to be the, the way forward, doesn't it, sharing this information? Has anybody got thoughts on the panel? Or? I, I think it would, be, it, 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 it would be super to link up the National Heart Failure Audit and and the genetics lab and you know be uh, and and the you know device registries and and the device audit and and link them all together so that we have a you know a national audit of you know inherited cardiomyopathies that we can then recruit to clinical trials through these different mechanisms. I I do not know how to accomplish that from a genetics lab point of view, but maybe Lima can can add to that. Actually, I wasn't going to comment on that. I, I had a question for Christopher. Uh, was there a mean age for the um, people uh, in your families that, that, that screen? So could we say anyone who is above 40 who actually yes. doesn't have a phenotype um, is low risk? Or yeah. should we say that even for a 20-year-old or a 12-year-old? That, that was a question. That I had the same question. I think that's really key for us. Yeah. I think that's also a very fair question. Um, so, so the mean age in, in the cohort was 38 years. So it's mostly kids and uh, parents and then siblings, of course, but, but it, it was 30, 38 years. Um, I think uh, the, the last um, plot I showed you of the age-specific incidence rates really shows that, that uh, it, this, um, uh, the, the importance of having abnormal findings uh, increases with, with age. So if you don't have any abnormal findings very late in life, so uh, after the age of 50, then perhaps it's not, uh, you know, doesn't make any sense. Um, from a per personal perspective, I, I would be very, you know, wary of, of finishing anyone if, if there's a good family history of disease, if they were had normal findings and were 30. Then, I, from my just that's just my personal opinion. I think it would be nice to scream then uh, more because finding a diagnosis in these patients, also the the patients where we have the biggest benefit, perhaps of of uh, finding a diagnosis because of life years lost. I don't know. I, I hope I answered your question. I, I actually had a um, question for you, Christopher, as well. Uh, looking at your data, uh, a question and a comment. In terms of the, what exactly are the abnormal echo findings that you've mentioned? Is it strain? Is it, because it might be important as a clinical message point of yes. view. Yes, so, like so it's, it's, it's very, it's very um, simple. So it's, uh, it's a, a left ventricle more than 117% the size of that predicted for age and sex and body size. And then it's a, um, a slight depression in the ejection fraction. So that would be an ejection fraction less than 55, but more than 50 um, as assessed by an expert uh, cardiologist. So, so one might say it, a bit of an overlap with uh, the other portion of the donut where you put the, the ones that uh, already get a diagnosis, but it's more like borderline, but still with conventional echo measurements, right? Uh, yes, so, so we don't have a global longitudinal okay. strain was not in it. Uh, and, and the reason was that some uh, did not have that data available at baseline. So we wanted to have as complete data as possible. And, and uh, you, but we have looked into global longitudinal strain, and it seems like that market is is more uh, sensitive uh, compared, perhaps, to uh, the EF. And you don't have MRI data. Uh, we we have on some, uh, but but uh, but then the the size of the cohort would be a lot smaller. I also think we tend to mostly do MRI in 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 uh, patients who have a genetic variant either a, a VUS or a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant. So the large group of patients where there's no genetic information, um, a lot of them will not 
receive a cardiac MRI, um, perhaps more now than before. But if we looked at just like five years ago, then probably not. Just the, the, that links with the comment that I wanted to make and also uh, relates to something that Brian said with phenotypes like philamine, mm. where sometimes the only thing is the late GED. Um, e probably even re regardless of the age, I think that should be probably the last step before implementing uh, the not to screen further mm. from a certain age. Um, yeah, but, but of course they would have been genetically screened. So, mm -hmm. so hopefully would, we would have picked them up. Uh, but I think the really important thing, uh, I think we can always improve our screening by performing more advanced screening. Mm -hmm. But I think the strength of, of the study that I showed you was that this, this screening we performed was very simple. Mm -hmm. And still our ability to, to, to identify people who did develop dilated cardiomyopathy and who did not was really good. Yeah, yeah. No, I meant still to be discovered genetic causes that yes. eventually could yes, present yes, with, with the ring scar or something. Yeah, fair enough. Excellent. And, and I might just add to that. I think it's, it's, it's really important to, to perform re-screening and re-evaluation of all the variants you have and, and, and be sure that you have enough blood uh, left over mm -hmm so that you can perform a genetic screening on that blood sample again, and that you have the appropriate you know, ways to, to do that. That's an important point. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, excellent presentations. My question is for Dr. Vissing. Um, can I ask you about um, uh, infant and childhood onset DCM severe phenotype? Um, in those families, did you find any of the siblings of those infants uh, presented in childhood with any um, symptoms where the parents themselves didn't express any phenotype, um, suggesting either a recessive inheritance or very varied penetrance and expression? Yes, so, so um, uh, we did have some of those families, but not a lot of them, uh, because they're primarily screened by pediatric cardiologists. Uh, but, but we did have some families, and, and uh, you're, uh, you're totally right, the, uh, the burden of, of you know, um, recessive inheritance is, is way higher um, in, in these patients. But we did find uh, a few families where there, there was a pediatric onset of dilated cardiomyopathy and, uh, and, and also uh, that uh, the siblings of these patients presented early in life uh, and also as children uh, often asymptomatic, but when the echo was performed, they did have cardiomyopathy. Was there a higher um, a sort of gene burden? Did you find more um, genetic causes in that, in that group of patients um, rather than the adult onset DCM patients? No, actually we didn't. You didn't? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question for Dr. Vissing. Um, so uh, there's a really important study, and I, I think that, that really helps us to begin to, to uh, be more selective about which patients we're going to screen. Um, my question is sort of related to Lima's question. Um, you showed a very low rate of new diagnoses in patients who've had an initial negative s clinical screen. Um, within that group, presumably there are some families who have high penetrance but are gene negative. Did you look at that? And if you did, could, if you took those patients out, you may find a, a, an, an even lower event rate in, or pickup rate in, in, in that cohort. Yes, I, I think you're right. Um, and I did look at it, and I don't remember the numbers now, um, but you're you're correct. <laughs> and I just wanted to add, uh, sort of, I know you're in the hot seat very much because it's a topic that's so important for us. Do you have a sense of how much, even when we identify people through screening, that will alter long-term outcomes as opposed to people presenting with shortness of breath or symptoms? And I think you have to take out the families, whether it's a sudden cardiac death or a genetic cause. But how much difference do you think we're making at the because we're with services so overloaded, are we, do you think in the bigger picture it's the right thing to do to screen these people who may be at risk later down the line, but for whom it won't really change their outcomes? Or are you happy that by giving earlier treatments and considering the devices, we're absolutely adding 
years to people's lives. If we're being totally honest, there's no data to support mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that there is a, a beneficial effect of, of finding these patients earlier. Uh, they live longer with disease, but if they live longer uh, per se, we don't have any data to support it. Mm -hmm. I think when we think about the, 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 the nature of the disease, it would make sense that we improved uh, the, the, mm -hmm. their longevity and, and that at least uh, in a subset of patients, uh, we avoided a sudden cardiac death. Um, but I think that's something that will will um, discover in the next 10 years. Mm. Um, and, and I think with, uh, you know, piggybacking on, on, on Brian's talk, the, 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 the new treatments that we're gonna get uh, yeah. is definitely gonna, gonna change something. And I think already now, I, I don't know if you do that here, but, but we do offer a, a selection of eggs for uh, in patients who have a uh, pathogenic RBM20, for example, mutation. So in that sense, you can say that you, you, you would reduce the burden of, of the disease, um, this very specific subset of patients. Um, but that's for the future. Mm, big questions. Can I ask Brian a question? Yeah. So Brian, basically, there's, it always strikes me that cardiomyopathy is over here and heart failure is over there and you briefly mentioned that we don't know how to solve that problem but there's lots of ways forward and obviously you come to the British Society of Heart Failure and if you started recruiting from a heart failure clinic the numbers in these trials could go up you know by exponentially so how do we marry the two specialties uh, you know and they're, they're really they're not different they're you know, the same so how do we try and bridge the gap between the cardiomyopathies and and heart failure. And we've got the UK HEF-PEF registry started, which, which you're part of, and why not do a UK heart failure registry and just buy a bank and, and record link people for outcomes? It, it seems like a no-brainer, and I'm sure the Danish are record linking their, their patients. They've got fantastic routinely collected data as well as we do. I think the heart failure audits may be something to begin with, and I knew in the updates of the heart failure audit, DCM and in, inherited um, aspects of the presentation will be collected, and then in, in terms of integrating the two communities, I mean, I, th I think I think we just you know joint sessions, joint conferences. I, I, I know our um, genetic counsellors, so we have genetic counsellors embedded within our service. Um, and they now, you know, will have direct referrals from the heart failure team. They go to the transplant meetings. I think the transplant service gets a, you know, um, there's a high yield from testing their patients because of, you know, because they have advanced disease. And I think, you know, having a direct access to genetic testing through a genetic counsellor bypassing, you know, the need to come and see us, us in clinic when really we're probably not going to add very much. Um, you know, it is a way to increase access to testing and hopefully make it more equitable for people around the country. Because um, I, I think there's huge inequity at the moment and we want to expand testing, but we have to make sure that, um, you know, there is as equal access to, you know, all the patients around the country and not just those seen in tertiary referral centres. Yeah, there's also the British Heart Foundation Clinical Research Collaborative, and I don't know if this group has got a separate group because that's the route to funding. You have got, yeah, okay. okay. So other comments from the. Uh, it's just a question from the. We've got a large virtual audience today of uh, over 100 people. So there's a question uh, for Joe Westby um, from that, um, asking about obesity, cardiomyopathy, and. Is it reversible if you lose weight? And the question's based on a sudden death that occurred um, in their region in someone that was very obese but had lost weight and then died suddenly. I don't know if you know the answer to it, but um, did you come across that in your, your cohort, people that had, that weren't, you know, very high BMIs but had an obese cardiomyopathy phenotype? Um, so, good question. I think with regards to the reversibility, there is some information in the literature, nothing that I would obviously be able to say from my cohort, that it is reversible with regards to losing weight and things. But um, I didn't identify any in our cohort. It did tend, as I said, it, we matched them 
not by the level of obesity, but just by the fact that they were obese. So it tended that the ones with the cardiomegaly, or I don't explain cardiomegaly, what we're referring to as obesity cardiomyopathy, was in those with a much higher BMI. But there were some cases with a lower BMI as well. Um, there are individuals who do have a higher BMI and still have a normal heart within, within our cohort as well. So it's possible not to be affected, but I'm sure, I think it's, it, it must put pressure on the heart. And this, I, as I've said, I think the, the important thing in our study is to make sure that there was no other explanatory variable in, uh, in the cases as well. I hope that answers it. And I've just got a question for Dr. Lopez, if that's all right, unless there are other ones from the audience. So I was interested in your cohort that you described of ALP K3 patients. Um, and I've got a family and the recessive um, members of the family have got early onset disease and short stature and one of them has cleft palate and I think there are some syndromic associations. I just wondered if um, any of those in your kind of dominant families had any um, dysmorphic features that might help us in identifying those families. So no, the answer is no. Um, so the, the heterozygotes do not have um, those type of extra cardiac involvement, which is somehow a surprise that we don't find in, in any of, of, yeah. of a relatively uh, large cohort. Uh, so that seems to come from uh, the, the dual hit or recessive uh, effect. Um, in terms of exocardiac, we, what we did find is an, a raised CK in some of these patients, okay. which suggests a peripheral muscle involvement. Still to be proven, but that's, that's all <laughs> in terms of exocardiac. Great, thank you. Any more questions? We've probably got time for one more. I was going to ask uh, Luis a quick question. Um, so we, we saw from Hugh Watkins' Mendelian randomization work the interaction between diastolic blood pressure and, and HCM, particularly the, you know, the, the non-sarcomeric ones. So uh, how low should we go with, with blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure in our patients? <laughs> I, well, obviously, no data, etc. But um, I think we will come to probably a suggestion similar to uh, what we do with diabetic patients, maybe just a, a slightly lower threshold um, as a target for these patients. If they do have um, a certain, uh, we, we could even target it in the future for a PRS score, I believe. So that would be nice. Uh, people with a high PRS score are targeting for a, a lower hypertension, but uh, we need data to, to answer that. Ed? Yeah. Uh, it was a slightly cheeky question for Mark, if that's okay. Edward Blair from Oxford. Um, Mark, we've got to start in England next year a newborn whole genome sequencing program. And you were making a very good argument there for prevention being be better than cure in dilated cardiomyopathy. So at what age? Should we start looking at these children's genomes for predisposition genes for dilated cardiomyopathy? Um, so I'm not a pediatrician, so I don't see children. Um, <laughs> so, so these are children with dilated cardiomyopathy? These are all newborns. Okay. Uh, 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 I mean, I think in terms of polygenic risk or to try to predict lifetime risk in, in a newborn without a family history of dilated cardiomyopathy, I, I imagine the yield um, is, is, is going to be small. And if we're going to be looking at the effect of an intervention, we're going to need lot of, you know, huge numbers of patients to show that that intervention is going to make a difference. So it, it's, it's not the population that I would pick to start um, these types of investigations in. But you know, if, if we look at family members of, of, of um, first degree relatives of, of probands and, you know, and those without you know, a, a rare variant. If we if if we find that the the proband has high polygenic risk, do we look at the polygenic risk in in, in the first degree relatives? Um, you know, e, e, even that, I imagine the the event rate in those first degree relatives is going to be pretty low. Great. Well, thank you everybody for a really enjoyable and interesting session. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, so, yeah.